This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for June 15th, 2023. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Today we're joined by Anthony Fauci, the former director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases of the National Institutes of Health, and for his last two years at NIAID, the chief medical advisor to the president. Although his final few years at NIH were dominated by the response to the COVID outbreak, it's important to remember that Tony headed NIAID for almost 40 years, a period of profound change in infectious and immunologic diseases. During that time, he was deeply involved in multiple outbreaks, including, in just the past few years, avian influenza, the original SARS, MERS, Zika virus, and Ebola virus. In addition to combating outbreaks, Tony led efforts at NIAID to treat and prevent everything from infections that affect millions of people across the globe to rare genetic diseases that result in chronic infections and inflammation. It's difficult to summarize his contributions beyond saying that no other person has had an impact anything like Tony's over the past several decades. Tony, you've had many opportunities to discuss the COVID outbreak recently. So rather than begin with that, I thought we could look forward and discuss other diseases. I'd like to start with the disease that's dominated the field and your own research for many years, HIV. During your time at NIAID, HIV changed from an invariably fatal illness to a treatable chronic disease. Worldwide, one of the biggest impacts has been the availability of therapies, something that was enabled in many countries by the PEPFAR program that you were instrumental in starting. Unfortunately, we still don't have a cure for HIV, so at this point, lifelong maintenance with antivirals is needed, and that's very dependent on funding. Do you think that that's sustainable? Well, it certainly is sustainable if the political and social commitment to it allows it to be, but from a scientific and public health standpoint, what you want to do is to, as best as you possibly can, enhance the prevention components that have actually, I think, over the last couple of years, had a major advance in the utilization and pre-exposure prophylaxis of injectables that can now be given every couple of months and hopefully with modification of the molecule can be given every six months. And I think that would be important both in the developed world, such as right here in the United States, but also in those countries, such as our Southern African counterparts, in which the idea of taking a pill or two every single day to prevent infection, as opposed to coming in intermittently into the clinic, is going to be something that I do believe is sustainable. That's the first thing. The second thing is, you're right, we still do not have a cure for HIV, but I think some of the research that's going on right now to, in a less expensive, intermittent way, maintain the level of circulating virus to below detectable in the principle of U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable is something that we really can maintain. But you're right, it really depends a lot on funding. And one of the things that we want to make sure that we don't let slip is the sustained funding and support of the PEPFAR program, because that is something that, as we all know, we're now in the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR. There have been $100 billion invested from the original $15 billion over five years. And at the last anniversary, which was just recently that we celebrated with President Bush, You looked at the results of that, there have been 25 million lives that have been saved. And I think when you look at the cost benefit of the incentive for continued and sustained funding, I think that's one of the most powerful arguments that we possibly can give to have that sustained funding. So I do believe it is sustainable. Oni, let me follow up on the first part of your answer there. It certainly would be great to have a method of preventing disease that didn't require so much interaction by the people who are taking the therapies. Certainly, I've heard a lot of stories, primarily from Africa, of partner violence being engendered by the fact that people are seen to be taking drugs um, and question of whether they're infected or they're questioning their partner. I want to extend that to the cure question, though, because if you had some sort of depot medication for therapy, not just for prevention, that would almost be a functional cure if it really worked. If you could only kick a shot every six months, what are the prospects for that? 
You know, Eric, I'm really glad you brought that up because that to me, I think we have to get our audience to appreciate exactly what you mean by cure. You know, if cure means eradication, we have a ways to go to get to the real eradication because we know of the integrative characteristics of the virus into the genome of a cell. But if you can get a depot medication that can be given twice a year, that in my mind, and I think you were suggesting it, Eric, is quite true, is essentially equivalent to a cure. I mean, you call it a functional cure, and we had a lot of semantic going back and forth years ago as to what the difference between an eradicative cure and a functional cure. If you can go in and get a medication at a clinic injection once every six months and have a level of virus below detectable and nobody knows about it but you in the clinic, to me, that's an aspirational goal that is achievable. At the beginning of the HIV epidemic, many thought that the most likely way to break the epidemic was through vaccination. But unfortunately, there's still no vaccine and there's been no highly successful trial. So what do you think we still need to do to get us to an effective vaccine? Well, Steve, to me, this is one of the most difficult scientific issues that the world and the interface between immunology and infectious diseases has faced. Because given the unique characteristics of HIV, the classic paradigm of what a vaccine does just does not apply when you're dealing with HIV. And let me briefly explain that. Through most vaccines that have been successful, the induction of an immune response, particularly when you have a pathogen that does not have much genotypic and phenotypic change, that you don't necessarily have to do sterilizing immunity to prevent the clinically consequential infection that you're trying to prevent. For example, when you get a polio vaccine, particularly the oral polio vaccine, and you get exposed to polio, you could get a few replications of the virus that never gets into the neurological system. And what you have then is essentially a complete protection against the clinical consequence of polio. But when you're dealing with HIV, you have a window that is so small, it's instantaneous. So if you get exposed and you wind up getting infected, and the virus develops, as we know, a number of studies from a number of labs, including my own years ago, show how quickly a reservoir is formed following infection, that even a vaccine that with another disease would have been considered highly effective, once the horse is out of the barn, that is not going to work. And that's what we have actually seen in the failures particularly superimposed upon the added challenge of a virus that continually mutates and changes. So having said that, in a somewhat downer way, let's look at the positive. And the positive is that we really do need to get broadly neutralizing antibodies. The sobering news is that the body does not like to make broadly neutralizing antibodies against HIV. We know that from natural infection, where only a relatively small proportion of the people ultimately make neutralizing antibodies, it usually takes about two years of active infection. And by the time it occurs, it doesn't neutralize the actual strain that has now been dominant in the patient. So the old paradigm that we were all taught in medical school is the best way to make a vaccine is to mimic natural infection is actually antithetical to the approach towards an HIV vaccine. You've got to do better than natural infection. So what does that mean? That means you have to engage the B cell repertoire in a way that it does not generally do easily. You've got to engage the B cell germline to go along and progress in a series of literal re-exposures at different levels of its affinity maturation. Now, a number of very competent, and I would say even brilliant investigators have been working on that for years and have made literally tiptoe type progress in pushing 
that evolution from the original derm line engagement to broadly neutralizing antibodies, but not all the way to the point where it's sustainable and literally is going to last and protect. So I do think it's achievable. I think it's going to be really one of the more difficult scientific problems for us to solve. But I mean, when you look at the eloquence of the work that's being done, I do have a hope. But I also must say, and this is sobering, but it's real, is that it is conceivable that we may not ever get a truly effective and safe vaccine for HIV in the classic way that we have for diseases like measles and polio and smallpox. It is conceivable that we won't, but that doesn't mean we should not continue to try along with the elegant studies that are being done. I'm going to go a little provincial here and ask you about a different disease, because as you said, HIV is a highly variable virus with different antigens being presented all the time. Tuberculosis, on the other hand, is not all that variable. The strains are highly related to one another. And yet, um, we have had very limited success with vaccines there, too. So let me ask you about your thoughts on the prospects for tuberculosis. Well, Eric, I think that in a different way, the prospects for a vaccine that would prevent initial infection versus a vaccine that would prevent the activation of latent TB are two different things. And I think the idea of getting a vaccine that would give us a degree of immunity to suppress any of the reactivation that you see, which is a major component of the epidemiology of tuberculosis, in my mind, I think is quite reasonable. Tuberculosis, as you know better than anybody, I'm a, I feel a little bit, <laughs> I would say, semi-compromised here in talking to you about it. But the fact is, Eric, is that it is really a very, very difficult problem that some people in the field of tuberculosis feel it's an insoluble problem of being able to do that. But I think we could at least make really important steps forward in getting the immune system to the point where you strongly prevent the reactivation of latent tuberculosis. Tony, going back to the HIV question, and as you commented, there's the failure of a sterilizing adaptive immune response in the classic sense that has been a real challenge with HIV. And then the emergence of broadly neutralizing antibodies with chronic infection or chronic antigen exposure being perhaps an important clue as to what might be protective immune responses. How do you think about the emerging technologies to allow us to iterate better, such as mRNA and other technologies that can allow us to leverage the human model as opposed to preclinical models to better understand how to bring out the best immune responses? Well, Lindsay, you're bringing up something that, as you know, uh, which is the reason you brought it up, is that is really an area of great excitement in all fields of infectious diseases and even in oncology is that the rather dramatic success of the utilization of the mRNA platform technology in COVID has really triggered the excitement of people in a number of fields, including in the field of HIV. And as you know, a number of laboratories now are using the mRNA technology for the natural, as you put it, expression of antigens in the right conformation. And that's going to really be the issue of how do you get it expressed in the proper conformation? We know you can make it very immunogenic. And I actually have been pleasantly surprised how some of the at least preclinical studies that have been done are showing that you can actually get good conformational success using an mRNA and even getting mRNA to get the antigen expressed in a viral-like particle, which is really interesting because you have the best of both worlds. You have the mRNA platform and it's giving you a viral-like particle, which I think is, you know, to me is still in the incipient stages now. But Lindsay, I think that that is something that absolutely needs to be actively pursued. And I know it is because it's such an exciting field. 
So for many in the infectious disease community, the worry has been that a new strain of influenza will cause the next enormous pandemic. We've had outbreaks and we've had some false alarms, but we still haven't seen anything near the magnitude of the COVID pandemic. Are you worried about this? And do you think we'll have better tools, maybe like some of the ones you've just been talking about, if and when a new pandemic flu strain emerges? Well, Stephen, I absolutely am worried about it. You know, I remember literally, you mentioned in the introduction that I had been the director of NIAID for short of 40 years, 38 plus years. And people always ask me what my worst nightmare is. And my worst nightmare has always been, and I'll say this, and you could look back the tail of the tape about what I've said many years ago, is that is the emergence of a highly transmissible respiratory virus that has the capability of a high degree of morbidity and mortality, and that likely would be influenza. Well, I was present except for the last part. It turned out to be a coronavirus, but that does not take away, Stephen, from the risk that we have and continually face as a civilization of an influenza of pandemic nature that does have those characteristics. And as you well know, with recorded history, that the last time that happened was in 1918. We had a 1957 pandemic flu, the H2N2. H1N1 was 1918. And then in 1968, we had H3N2. And then in 2009, we went back to H1N1 again. Those were pandemics that, as we all know, I mean, I was an intern during the 1968, and it didn't disrupt society. We saw a lot of people come in the hospital, but it didn't have the disruption of the social order the way the 1918 pandemic had and the way the 2019-2020 coronavirus did. But there always is the looming threat of the evolution, either by recombination, resortment, or what have you, of a flu that does have those characteristics. Now, having said that, what about the science of it? And that's the reason why we all have been talking about and actually doing something about a lot of work to get a pan-influenza vaccine, one that literally can cover both group one and group two, and within group one and group two, the subgroups, the H3N2s, the H1N1s, as well as the bird flus, the H5s, the H7s, the ones that perhaps if they recombine and resort would use the morbidity mortality aspect that we see in the bird flu with the transmissibility that you see with a classical human flu. There is a danger of that. And the danger of that, as we know, occurs when you have mixing of species, both humans and different animals, pigs with birds, humans in wet markets and things like that, where you have the capability of that happening. So the short answer is the positive aspect is I think the work that's being done on new platform technologies, new immunogen design to get a pan-influenza vaccine is really quite encouraging. So I'm going to be looking forward in the next few years that hopefully we'll get a lot of new information on that that would really have a positive impact. Tony. I agree. I share the concern that another respiratory virus can be as devastating as 1918 and then the recent COVID. But I do worry that we take for granted the pandemics we have every year with flu and RSV, with 50,000 or more dying in this country alone. And how should we get the political will, the medical will, the scientific focus to what I would say address the pandemics that we've just become accustomed to? Great question, Lindsay. And I think what we've seen over the last few weeks, I think, addresses one of the issues that you bring up. You know, we have RSV, which not only in this country, but worldwide is a major source of morbidity. And in some respects, less so in this country, but in other countries more, mortality, not only in infants, but even in the elderly. I mean, the two bookends of one's life, you have the susceptibility to RSV. And now, literally in the last couple of months, based on some really terrific science that was done, you know, at the fundamental basic level, which is the reason I always say 
you know, and I harp on it, and I know everybody on this podcast is aware of that, of why we have to keep investing in basic and clinical research. I mean, the idea of the work that Barney Graham and Jason McLellan and Peter Kwong and all the others have done by being able to make a couple of simple mutations. I say simple, it took them years to get to be able to have the prefusion stabilization of the F protein in RSV has led to vaccines for the elderly, vaccines for mothers so that they can have transplacental transmission of antibody to the baby, and now monoclonal antibodies for the treatment or for the prevention in normal children, not just children at risk. So to me, Lindsay, that's a classic example of addressing things that we've taken for granted on a year-by-year basis by applying the new technologies that maybe we just forgot about applying them because the diseases were too old. I mean, Eric may remember several years ago when we had a meeting in Seattle that Bill Gates called about tuberculosis. And I said, we need to bring the sleepy field of tuberculosis into the technological advances of the 21st century. And that's why we're starting to see some advances in that field, because you can't take for granted a disease that we've kind of accepted as part of the background. But Lindsay, as you point out, when you look at the background, the background's a lot of morbidity and mortality that we should not take for granted. Since you brought up the preventive or therapeutic antibodies for these, I wonder about the role of antivirals. After all, antivirals have been the cornerstone, really, of HIV treatment and HIV prevention, as you pointed out before. Do they have a substantial role in these acute viral infections? Yes, I really do think so particularly when you're dealing with a situation among vulnerable people. So let's take RSV and COVID as two examples. And when I talk to my residents and students, I always try to bring that out. I mean, infectious diseases are such a phenomenally fascinating field, but virology is one of the subgroups that's really profoundly fascinating. So you have viruses that in many people either give no symptoms or minimal symptoms. Testis S, RSV, testis S, COVID. In some people, that same virus is going to give you moderate, mild symptoms. In other people, it'll bring you in the hospital. And in some people, it'll kill you. And we've seen both RSV and COVID do just that. So when you're dealing with the development of antivirals for respiratory illnesses, we should not be put aback and less enthusiastic about getting powerful antivirals when you have a disease that in many people are of minimal consequence. Because in some subsets of people, it can be profoundly damaging from a morbidity and mortality standpoint. And I think the classic example of that is Paxlovid. I mean, right now, you know, if you have a 25-year-old person gets a couple of sniffles, you should say, well, you should give them Paxlovid. Very, very few physicians would do that. But if you look at the data now of people who are vaccinated, who if they do get infected, and as we all know, given the relatively weak protection against initial infection in individuals, if you give that person Paxlovid, there are almost no deaths in that group. No matter how old the person is, no matter what their underlying condition. So the combination of vaccine with the proper updating of boost together with a good antiviral in SARS-CoV-2 is a great example. I think if we apply that to influenza, I mean, we really do need better antivirals for influenza. I mean, everybody believes that. I mean, if we could get a Paxlovid-like antiviral for influenza, I think we would see a significant diminution of influenza deaths among people who are vulnerable. Bottom line, short answer to your question, Eric, yeah, we really should do that. And now that we have structure-based vaccine and structure-based antiviral design, we can pinpoint vulnerable targets very easily. 
In all of this, where do you see the breakthroughs in infectious disease coming in the next decade? Well, we have touched, Stephen, on some of them. I think a potential breakthrough in my mind would be an HIV vaccine of moderate effectiveness and maybe hopefully significant effectiveness. I think the idea about continuing along the line in tuberculosis of drugs that would markedly diminish even more than we've been able to do the duration of time that's needed to treat, including against multiple and extensively drug-resistant TB. That's where I see a breakthrough there. I think the point that Lindsay mentioned about influenza, I think a pan-influenza vaccine would be a breakthrough. And I think at least the thing that we were working on at NIAID and are still working on, despite the fact that I left, I hope that they get the uh, funding to continue it, is something that we refer to as our pandemic preparedness plan, where you have the prototype pathogen approach, which Barney Graham and others first wrote about, where you essentially pick out seven or eight families of viruses that have within them viruses of pandemic potential, and you do some fundamental core work that's extrapolatable across all of the members of that family, be it immunological correlates, be that design of platforms applicable to that particular virus, correlates of immunity, a whole variety of things. I think those are the things. And the other thing is something that relates a bit to what Eric said, is the use of monoclonal antibodies, that if you can actually get a menu of monoclonal antibodies that you could produce and have available quickly to be able to turn it around, and right now, that's easily done. All you need to do is to get the sequence of that virus very quickly. That, I think, could be a major therapeutic boon to any of a number of infectious diseases. So those are just a few of the breakthroughs. You know, since you brought up monoclonal antibodies, I wanted to give a shout out to some of the work done at NAID in malaria. Monoclonal antibodies do seem to be a modality that can be used to prevent disease. At the same time, the progress in anti-malarial drugs has been really tremendous worldwide. It's really one of the most exciting fields in all of infectious disease. Do you think there's a chance of eradicating this disease? You know, Eric, as long as we have such extraordinary prevalence of the vector in the climates where malaria is prevalent, you would have to do a major, major, consistent, broad public health endeavor. And that really relates, I want to get back to what you said, because I'm very, very enamored of the monoclonal antibody approach to malaria particularly with my good friend, Bob Cedar, who, you know, played a major role in that in a really classic paper that came out. If you can get a monoclonal antibody that you can treat and then give a monoclonal antibody during the season of malaria, because in many countries, most people don't appreciate, it really is quite seasonal malaria. And others, you know, you can get some risk anytime, but in many countries, it's quite seasonal. You can, on a local basis, essentially eliminate malaria from a village. And that's one of the things that Bob and their colleagues and the other people who do malaria at the NIH, is not only Bob, there are any of a number of people that are doing it, that if you can do proof of concept with a monoclonal antibody as a prevention of malaria, once you rid the parasite from the village... (laughs) and then give a monoclonal antibody, if you can scale that up at a regional level, I think that it is possible, at least at various locations, you can eliminate malaria. But, you know, with regard to the question that you asked, can you do it on a continental basis? That's going to be tough. That's going to be tough. Um, As you mentioned, Tony, there are so many advances in this space and the alterations of the vector and vector manipulation is also very exciting. But I wanted to get your thoughts on, since we're touching on kingdoms, viral kingdom, parasitic kingdom, the bacterial kingdom, in the sense that antimicrobial resistance faces all of us every day. Do you have any thoughts on advances in that space? 
because it's something that all practitioners are dealing with every time they see a patient. Yeah, you know, Lindsay, it's multiple buckets to that, as you well know. One is the due diligence of the appropriate use of antibiotics and monitoring the use of antibiotics in a way that, you know, some people might find it intrusive on their clinical practice, but sometimes you really have to do that. In other words, really have good recommendations. The other is diagnostics. If we had better diagnostics, a lot of unintentional mistakes would not be made. And the other is to incentivize the pharmaceutical companies to be able to, and you're gonna have to do that with some serious financial incentives. In other words, you're gonna want to get them to make an antibiotic that hopefully they'll never have to use. <laughs> you know, So how do you do that? Now, maybe it's sort of a version of Operation Warp Speed for antimicrobials, you know, where you make a major investment on the part of the federal government, you know, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of criticism for saying that, but I mean, so be it, is to be able to really de-risk for the companies the idea that they're going to make an antibiotic that you want to use on the very special circumstances to avoid the emergence of antibiotic resistant at the same time that you do very good control of the use of antibiotics in hospitals. One of the impressive successes at NIAID has been the use of advanced methods, including gene therapy, bone marrow transplants, to treat and cure rare genetic immune defects. How do you see this focus on unusual diseases in the context of common autoimmune diseases? Well, gene therapy in its classic form, Stephen, is very unlikely going to have a major role in replacing a gene and a immune deficiency, correcting a genetic defect, the whole issue of the now exciting successes that we've seen with sickle cell disease and with other diseases in which gene therapy. But there is a role for genetic related or gene therapy in autoimmune diseases, because you know, the correction of autoimmune diseases really relates more to correcting the immunoregulatory aberrations that become the mainstay of these attempts to treat autoimmune diseases. You can do it, as you know, broadly, glucocorticoids, methotrexate, or you can try and specifically knock out what the cause of the immunoregulatory abnormality and aberrancy is. And if you can do that, by infusion of cells that have infusion, that have insertion of genes that turn on or turn off a certain immunoregulatory cytokine, I think that certainly is the way to do it. The other way that is, I mean, obviously a rather, I would say, draconian way to do it, but if you have intractable autoimmune disease that's leading to the demise of the patient, there's been some successes now in classic autoimmune diseases of ablations and transplantation with stem cells. You know, that is in some ways, if you want to put cells back in that have been modified to be able to control what would be aberrant immunoregulatory cytokines, that's one way of doing it. It's a field that is still, I think, have a long way to go to be able to make that jump of classic gene therapy to autoimmune diseases as opposed to selectively using those technologies to modify the aberrant immunoregulatory events. I'd like to get back to what you said about the importance of basic science in translation to patients. Um, the immune system is pretty complicated. I remember taking immunology when I was a freshman in college and nothing that I learned is correct any longer. And particularly when it gets to immunoregulation and the idea of immune networks and regulatory T cells, it seems like we still have a ways to go with understanding. The question is, are we getting very close to translating even though our understanding is incomplete? Eric, that's a good question because there's always a balance there because you want to translate 
what you know now with the thought in mind that you don't know everything you need to know. So since I look upon the field as an immunologist as sort of this vast horizon that we don't even know what the limits of it are right now, you can't be frozen in time and try and let the perfect be the enemy of the good and say, well, we don't really fully understand this network. Therefore, we're not going to try and interfere with it. So it's risky. You take a chance. And I'll bet you, uh, uh, you know, a, a pizza <laughs> that, in fact, years from now, we're going to look at things that look like they were moderately successful by the modification of an aberrant immunoregulatory network that just the way when you were sitting in your college class learning things that you now know are incorrect, we're going to find out that they were incorrect. They were appropriately to be done at the time, but given what we know about it now, you know, it would be very, very difficult to say it was the most correct approach. Eric, I want to bring that up because it's so important in getting our young scientists and young physicians to appreciate that one of the things about science is, as you pointed out the example from your immunology class, it's self-correcting because it's, you know, it's a mechanism science to get evidence and data. And as you get more evidence and data, you change how you act on it. You change guidelines, you change recommendations, you change the kinds of things you do. We've got to make sure that that doesn't get confused with saying that science is not an extraordinary discipline that has brought us to things that would have been unimaginable years ago. And as you know, with the anti-science theme that becomes more and more prevalent in our society, that's a tool that's used against us saying, well, you said this a year ago, and now you're saying this. Well, you know, that's because the data and the evidence have evolved and we're appropriately using the principles of science by using the most recently available data to make decisions. And it has to do with everything we're talking about today. But Tony, I mean, you raise the important point that science is self-correcting, that we learn. And as we learn, we improve our understanding of a process or of a treatment. As we've discussed before, and as you've mentioned before, trust is so important as we try to improve health and communicate how to improve health. Where has society gone wrong in how we're communicating today and there's such distrust toward science? And what can we do to help improve that communication? Yeah, Lindsay, that's a great question that a lot of people are spending full time trying to address that question. And you know, you could be broad and simplistic and to say there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there that just loves the social media. It absolutely spreads like a tsunami. So what we in the scientific community have to do is to realize that that's a problem and to get our young people to not be afraid of openly discussing and communicating the principles of science and the findings of science, and to realize that there are standard edited evaluations of scientific principles, the journal being one of the most important in the world, to really get people to appreciate that they've got to be critical in their thinking. And I think that goes well beyond the scientific community, Lindsay. It goes back to perhaps we need to get a better degree of scientific sophistication in our society and science literacy. That doesn't mean that everybody has to be a scientist, but maybe we can incorporate in our educational system an understanding of the principles of science so that young people, even if they don't go into science, understand exactly what you just mentioned and which I mentioned and others mentioned, is that science is indeed a self-correcting process. because. People who want to be mischievous about it, and it goes beyond mischief, it's outright destructive, that they can take that principle and make it look like science doesn't mean anything because you keep changing. So you can say anything you want, 
and then you could claim it to be the truth. And in an arena of the normalization of untruths, it's very dangerous for science. So you talked about young physicians and scientists, and one of the challenges facing infectious disease is the increasing difficulty in attracting trainees, especially since it's not the best paying specialty. So what changes would you make to try to attract more people into the field? Well, you know, there are rewards and incentives that get people to do things. I mean, obviously, one of the incentives is financial incentive. We don't have any degree of procedures that are of the type that you can do it in 15 minutes and charge a couple of thousand dollars for it. You know, we are generally the internists of the world. I mean, I know when somebody's got a real problem that they need to work out in a patient, there's always seems to be the possibility or reality of an infection in there. And I have found myself at the NIH when I get called to see a patient that you all of a sudden become the internist plus ID person for the patient. That is not rewarded. I mean, whether or not we're going to get the payment systems to appreciate that more, I hope we do, but I don't think that necessarily is going to get so far. But what I do think we can do is that in the academic setting, to really make it attractive for people who want to go into infectious diseases with academic rewards to really value the importance of the infectious diseases person. And to do that, and I tried to do that when I was director of NIAID to get people incentivized to enter into a field. You guys remember way back in the early years of HIV that we put money on the table and we got people who may not have had been involved in HIV to get involved in HIV. And now we have some of the best investigators in the world, most highly sophisticated ones. But HIV is not a hot topic now. I mean, you guys are closer to it than I am, you know, in the Boston schools, but it isn't like somebody goes and says, wow, I really want to go into HIV. We don't see that the way we saw it years ago. For the three years of COVID, when we dumped an incredible amount, appropriately, of money into COVID, everybody was getting involved in COVID. As COVID now goes down from 4,000 deaths a day down to yesterday, it was what, 65 deaths? You know, the idea of people getting excited about COVID. So we've got to be able to get them chronically excited about the field by essentially making the opportunities in a research and the bridge between research and clinical medicine much more attractive for young people. And we can do that at the academic level, supporting of grants, supporting of training in infectious diseases. I think the idea about saying we're going to get them more money is a lost cause. I don't think that that's going to be substantive. I think they should get paid much more than they do, but I don't think that that's going to turn it around. It's going to be making it a much more desirable, respectable subspecialty in the setting of the academic community. I do want to take the opportunity to say that the practice of clinical infectious disease and the research around it is really fun. I think that people who give up on it for some of the reasons that uh, you mentioned, Steve, and that you mentioned, Tony, should give it a chance because it is really one of the most rewarding parts of all of medicine. I know I have self-interest here, but I really would encourage people who are listening to this to consider this very exciting field. You know, Eric, if I might just take an extra 30 seconds, I often get asked, particularly when I was stepping down, when people were doing a historical retro look at my career, were saying, why did you pick infectious diseases? And the answer I gave is that just what you said, you know, it's, it's so exciting both at an individual patient level and at the broader public health level. It's acute, it's identifiable, it's treatable, and it's preventable. For goodness sakes, you couldn't make something up more more exciting than that. So finally, just one question about COVID. Well, as you say, Tony, there are fewer deaths the disease is still around. In fact, there's evidence from wastewater monitoring that there might actually be increased transmission in some areas. So what does this mean and how should we respond? 
Stephen, I think that relates to what we all said a little bit ago, is that given the fact that the latest blood bank survey indicated that about 94 to 96% of the people in this country, at least those who go get blood, have either been infected and or vaccinated because they found antibody in. So right now, what we were saying about the difference between infection and disease, that you could be having infection that's represented by an increase of virus in wastewater, not manifested necessarily with disease because a lot of people have a degree of protection. However, and let me underline this, however, it could also mean that there is a smoldering increase that is going to manifest itself a month or two from now. So it's two aspects of it that you have to keep in mind, Stephen. Number one, you got to pay attention. So you got to monitor this disease. It has fooled us. Let's not forget, you know, Delta in the spring of 21, Omicron in Thanksgiving Day was my Omicron day <laughs> back here in Washington, that it could be the early sign of another breakthrough. At the other hand, it may be a sign that the virus will always be around, but if enough people have a combination of vaccine-induced and infection-induced or hybrid immunity, that you're not going to see disease reflective of the amount of infection that's going on. So there's two possibilities there. You've got to keep an eye on both of them. Thank you, Tony, for joining us today. And as always, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Lindsay.